All right, great. Thank you so much. So welcome, everybody. This is the first meeting of the COVID-19 uh, Response Special Committee of the Springfield City Council. I'm City Councilor Jesse Letterman, Chairman of the Committee, and we're joined here today uh, by the President of the Springfield City Council, Marcus Williams, as well as uh, Councilor Adam Gomez and Senator Adam Gomez. We're also joined by Councilor Melvin Edwards, Councilor Sean Curran, and Councilor Tim Allen. And then we are also joined on the call uh, by the uh, Director of Health and Human Services, Helen Calton Harris, uh, Deputy CAFO, Lindsay Hackett, Grants Coordinator, Melanie Jacoby, uh, Director of Economic Development, Tim Sheehan, and Jerry McCafferty from the Office of Housing. Um, so we have a, a good agenda. Um, we're gonna move right through it. I just wanted to say sort of in opening with the first uh, committee meeting, uh, our goal in, in talking with the president and also in talking with the commissioner uh, is to utilize this as a forum for counselors to stay up to date and engaged uh, with the work that is going on uh, for COVID response in the city. Also an opportunity for counselors to collaborate uh, with the administration and various department heads, as well as each other on efforts that we may be undertaking as individual counselors. And then furthermore, uh, to also develop a, a platform for public participation and public input uh, and feedback on the COVID-19 response. Um, so with that, in mind, uh, we are going to be scheduling uh, weekly meetings of the committee to take place on Tuesdays at 4.30 p.m. Uh, those meetings are open to all counselors. Uh, certainly, we don't need uh, every single department head at every single meeting. We recognize the, the schedule of the department heads is uh, certainly loaded, especially these days. However, the commissioner has graciously agreed uh, to join us for a briefing at those times just to let us know the status of what is occurring and uh, any uh, major issues that, that might be going on that the council can be helpful with regard to. And then what uh, the president and I will also be doing is working to engage different community organizations uh, that may be doing work to come in and brief counselors at that time. Uh, and also for counselors to be able to bring things to the table on a regular basis. Certainly uh, we are rounding the corner, uh, but we still have a long way to go in terms of the COVID-19 response and then future uh, recovery. So we expect uh, to see some robust conversations in the days, weeks, and months ahead. So the first uh, item on our agenda is a report and briefing, as I mentioned, from uh, the Commissioner of Health and Human Services. So at this time, uh, Commissioner Colin Harris, I'd invite you uh, to share with uh, the counselors uh, and gathered department heads uh, the status of what's going on from your department's perspective. Thank you very much, um, Councilor Letterman and Council President Williams. As I said to both of you, I view this um, uh, defeating COVID-19 as a collaborative effort, and I'm happy uh, that the City Council will be engaged uh, with us. And so the briefing that I'm going to give really is consistent with the briefing that I give every Monday uh, to the, um, uh, the community. Um, I would invite you to ask any questions. I am not going to uh, labor long uh, with the data update. I'll talk a little bit about uh, vaccinations and I'll talk a little bit about the VAX force and I will try to move through uh, this expeditiously. So in terms of the city of Springfield and where we are, I don't think it's any secret to anyone that we are uh, in a surge. I should also say that every document that I have is up on the city's website and so you certainly are welcome once a week to go and look and see what the data is uh, for the city. And so um, right now, the city, as well as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, is in a surge. Uh, so far in the month of January, we've had 2,394 cases. If you recall, in December, it was the highest month we've ever had with 4,496 cases. Thinking about that, we are halfway uh, to that point right now. And so I expect that January is going to be another month where we see cases that are really going to um, outnumber uh, what we've had in the past. This week, uh, the city of Springfield on Sunday had 100 and, and we're talking last Sunday, um, had, uh, January 10th had 167 cases. On Monday, there were 30 because there was a glitch in the state system. And so the uh, bulk of the Monday cases appeared on Tuesday and that number was 214. 
Wednesday, 181 cases, Thursday, 116, Friday, 213, and then Saturday, 122. I will tell you that on Sunday, we had 168 cases, and Monday, I do not have the final numbers, but uh, it will be around 132 cases. Those numbers will be reported next uh, Monday when we do our update. Let me talk a little bit about the zip codes that are impacted. And so 01101 had seven cases. Now 01101 really is MGM. Um, there are no really residential numbers in 01101. So when I see cases in 01101, I know that those are cases that were reported uh, from MGM. 01103 had 16 cases, 1%. 01104, 165 cases, 16%. 01105, 70 cases, 7%. 01107, 96 cases, 9%. 08, 207 cases, 20%. 09, 174 cases, 17%. Uh, and then 18 had 91 cases at 9%. And then 1-9 had 89 cases at 8%, 2-8, 14 cases, 1%, and 2-9, 49 cases, 5%. And then 5-1 had 65 cases, and that was uh, 6%. As far as race and ethnicity is concerned, um, there were no uh, uh, American Indian cases that we have. Uh, Asians, 4%, uh, Black African American, 15%, Latin X, 21%, Native Hawaiian, 1%, White, 38%, and then we had 21% uh, that appeared as unknown. We still see the majority of our cases under the age of 50. 71% uh, of our cases were under the age of 50. However, it's important to note that that number is going down while the over uh, 50 cases going up. So that was 29%. Uh, we care about that because we know that it is the over 50 uh, individuals who will wind up potentially hospitalized or severe uh, COVID. And that's why we are um, paying attention to, to that number. It is, it is critical. The other number I think it's important to note um, is uh, that we are had 11 individuals die from last week to this week. Uh, they ranged from age 51 to age 99. So a 68-year-old Hispanic, 72-year-old Hispanic, 80-year-old Hispanic, 99-year-old Hispanic, a... Um, in the black community, there were a 76 year old, a 77 year old and 86 year old. In the white community, a 78 year old, a 51 year old, a 76 year old and a 73 year old. Um, we also talked a little bit about the um, schools and AMR and testing. We will be standing up an additional testing site at Putnam School probably next week, that testing site will be for Springfield residents only. Um, right now, the only other testing site is at Eastfield Mall. And as you know, there are long lines there and there are individuals waiting. And so we are going to do our best uh, to set up a site so that our residents have a place that they can go and hopefully uh, we'll, be uh, we'll be able to expedite that process. I have also been asked by State Representative Williams uh, to stand up a site in Mason Square. I am working through that now, um, and hopefully I'll be able to report next week uh, that the Putnam site and a site in Mason Square um, have been set up. We continue uh, to test and trace. Um, we have at least... Um, you know, we are sending some of our, our cases to the Contact Tracing Collaborative based on the fact um, that we need, I need our staff to be focused on vaccination uh, right now uh, and last week. And so our nursing staff have been uh, working with the vaccination clinics. Springfield Public Schools sent us six, the vaccination site. You know that we 
Vaccinated last week, 920 individuals in the city of Springfield. The site uh, was staffed by Springfield Public Schools, as well as AMR, the Springfield Department of Health and Human Services. The Parks Department as well uh, sent us uh, some individuals uh, to help us as well. So all in all, it was really a very uh, good effort and we will repeat that effort um, at the end of this week. We have also set up the Vax Force. The Vax Force is a group of individuals. Again, you can find their names on the city website and their job is really to um, do the research around vaccination so that we can present a white paper and or a town hall where we are um, absolutely taking questions from the public um, and uh, giving credible um, information to the public. The subcommittees for uh, VaxForce um, are uh, critical to moving us forward. And so um, what we have three different phases that talk about communication, talk about research, faith community, um, and there is one more, oh, the clinical and then operation. So there are uh, six committees that have been set up by the Vax Force. Many of our uh, committee members are signing up for very specific committees. Their job will be to do the research in that area. Once they have the research, we will publish that research. Um, and um, we will, at the end of Vax Force, have a document uh, that we're going to present to the public in order to. Um, make sure that we're getting credible information into the hands of those individuals who need it. The uh, uh, Diversity and Equity Committee will begin to look very specifically at the populations in city of Springfield and the myths and misconceptions there are about vaccine. I will stop there and see if there are any questions. Commissioner, thank you so much. I know that was really helpful and, and there was definitely some new information in there, at least for myself. Um, if uh, counselors have questions for the commissioner, I just ask that you raise your hand at this time. And while we just wait for some hands to be raised, um, I just had a couple of uh, quick questions based on your report. For the Putnam site, uh, do you anticipate that being a, a just a one day pop up site or do you anticipate prolonged uh, testing at that, that site? Uh, same for the Mason Square site. Yeah, both of those sites will be up. A Mason Square will be up for a minimum of three weeks. Um, we, I anticipate the Putnam site will stay up longer um, and, and it will be based on need. What AMR is telling me right now is that the lines at Eastfield Mall are not as long as they were. The wait time is not the same. However, uh, what we know is that everybody doesn't have a car. Um, everybody may not have the ability to get to Eastfield Mall. And so we want to make it as convenient as we can for those areas um, of, of uh, high density. The uh, New North Citizens Council received a $100,000 line item from uh, the state. And I'm not sure who put the line item in, but they did get a line item. They will be testing in the North End um, at the Greek Cultural Center um, with that money. And AMR will be doing that testing as well. That's excellent. And then just um, on, the, on the vaccine distribution, I know that we've uh, begun uh, through the city clinics uh, vaccinating some first responders in, in our ranks. Um, I'm starting to hear from some constituents who are falling into other phase one and phase two categories who are wondering when it comes time for those categories to be vaccinated, but not yet the general public, how that will be handled. Have we received any information from the state about that because at this point their PCPs are, are basically telling them they don't they don't know. That's an excellent question and I have to tell you I feel um, as though um, the Commonwealth um, in terms of its categories left out some very important categories that to me are first responders such as animal control. When you think about that they're not um, in the first resort, water and sewer, they're in and out of houses every day. Um, taking care. I know that because they send me the list to make sure that there are no COVID um, cases within that house in the last three weeks. So there are some first responders that are not fire, police, EMS, EMTs, but they do do first responder activity. To your very specific question, yes, we have heard from the uh, Commonwealth um, and they are going to set up a mass vaccination site in the Springfield area. 
Um, and uh, I do not have the uh, particulars, although they have made some information uh, known out east, like Gillette Stadium. You saw there are uh, there are uh, mass uh, vaccination sites that are being set up. The Department of Health and Human Services will not be a part, to my knowledge, of those vaccination sites. We will, however, continue uh, to vaccinate at our smaller um, and a smaller venues, just like we're doing at Boland School. The other thing that the Commonwealth is doing at this point is setting up sites um, at CVSs. They're looking at CVSs um, as sites where individuals can go to get vaccinated. I have not wanted to, uh, at this point, we're not doing 75 and older with two comorbidities or 65. Once we open that up, we have got to be ready to receive thousands and thousands of people. And I know that had if we do that, then we as a city are going to get backlash around not doing an appropriate job because of the, you know, just not having the capacity. So uh, once we do 75 and 65 and older, we really need a mass vaccination site. So we are not turning people away. And I think that I think the, the concern that I've heard uh, around once the vaccine is ready for that broader distribution, whether it's with the uh, individuals who are 65 and 75 plus with the comorbidities, or once we move to the general public, I think we just want to make sure that there's a way uh, for people to be able to get them in their neighborhoods um, because it's so critical. And so I know we're a little ways away from that, and we'll probably have that as the topic of a of a specific meeting. Um, so I want to move uh, to Councillor Allen, who has a question, and then if there's any further questions for the commissioner, um, and I see Councillor Davila as well. So we'll go Councillor Allen, followed by Councillor Davila. Okay, uh, thanks, Councillor Letterman. Uh, Helen, thanks for the update. I listened this morning as well. Um, I'm wondering, when you set up these, like Putnam or these other places, are those yours? You just delineated and said certain ones will not be Health and Human Services people, they'll be state people. But you know the Putnam one, the Mason Square one, if they come to be, is that staffed by your own staff kind of thing? So the um, city of Springfield, you were talking about testing now, not vaccination. I just want to be clear um, yeah. so that AMR will do the testing, but will we be the funding entity as a city? Will we provide um, the support and necessary for them to be successful? Will we have staff at those sites? Yes but they will not be our sites as far as doing the testing is concerned. Okay, and so so those happen and that's clear how that works. And then there's this, whatever, you just said a big, big one somewhere um, where the state would run that kind of thing or would provide people. And is, does there need to be coordination between those two things, say Putnam and Mason Square are involved with AMR and your staff is there and the state is doing a big, testing facility, uh, testing operation somewhere else. What degree of coordination needs to be done between people, between those things? Or is so, it just, it's testing so anybody can go and you just test and that's that? So uh, Mason Square and Putnam will be for Springfield residents only. We're talking about testing at this point. East yep. Mall is for anybody in the region because it stopped the spread. So those testing sites, again, we're not talking about vaccination, we're talking about testing. When the vaccination happens on a mass scale, uh, that will be the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, the Board of Health, Health and Human Services, AMR, we will continue to do smaller sites. Will there be coordination? Um, I think there'll be um, conversation. I don't think we'll coordinate with them around uh, our process and how we're going to serve our residents, but um, there will be conversation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Councillor Davila. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner Hoffman. Um, before I ask a question, I'm going to come back to the commission committee. Councilor Davila, I'm sorry. I think I know you may be um, calling in. I think your connection is a little weak. Um, if you could just try to move, or if you're having a problem, maybe put it in the chat and we can read it for you because um, we can't understand what you're saying. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, still a little fuzzy, Councilor. Okay, if you don't mind, I can tell I'm still on mute. I'm going to yield and come back. 
Okay. We will recognize you when you return, Councilor Devil. All right, are there any other um, questions for Commissioner Colton Harris uh, while we see if Councilor Davila is able to reconnect with a better connection? Uh, President Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just more so a comment than a question, but I just wanna thank the commissioner for being willing to uh, certainly work across the aisle here to uh, conduct these briefings as time goes on, as well as the other department uh, heads and city staff. Um, you know, this is the biggest public health crisis that we probably have faced all in our lifetimes. So uh, definitely thought it was incumbent on um, just myself to create this committee to, um, and just, just in the name of a collaboration and working again across the aisle to, to defeat this pandemic is the ultimate goal for everyone here. So I just wanna thank you all for participating and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, uh, council president. Again, I am appreciative, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, seeing uh, no further hands, um, if Councilor Davila does rejoin us, we'll, we'll recognize him to, to ask his question. Um, thank you, Commissioner, for, for all the information. I know that uh, you and your staff are, are working incredibly hard and it is definitely appreciated by, by the entire council and by the community. I think probably our next conversation might be um, probably more based on, on uh, vaccine logistics as we learn more. And I know that that is primarily the questions uh, that we're getting right now. I see Councilor Davila is back with his hand up, so we'll see if we can hear him uh, this time. Councilor Davila. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Council Davila, I'm sorry, but we still can't hear you. Um, so uh, perhaps we can you can connect with the commissioner. Um, offline, or again, if you want to put your, it sounds like you can hear us. So if you want to put your question in the chat or, or text me your question, I'll be glad to ask it of the commissioner. Can anybody else hear Councilor Davila? Okay. All right, Councilor Davila. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, have you connect with the commissioner uh, offline. Uh, unfortunately, your connection uh, is not allowing us to, to hear you. Um, but we do also want to thank Councilor Davila. He is actively working as a paramedic in the city right now on the front line. Uh, so we appreciate his service and in both. Uh, thank both thank oh. you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now, Councilor Davila. Yes, excellent. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, the the uh, issues of uh, life technology. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief. Uh, I just want to, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, my compliments to the council president for the creation of this uh, committee. I think it's a very well uh, important committee uh, at this time. Uh, but my commission to the, my question to the commissioner is, um, I know that we have been talking about the frontline workers, uh, but I've been thinking um, what I, something that I have not seen yet uh, is the clergy. Uh, where do the clergy fall in terms of vaccination? As we know, they are out and about in the community. They're an important part of the fabric of society. Uh, are we Councillor uh, Devola, I, be I believe that clergy are in general population. I certainly uh, will look again at the um, vaccination phases, but I do not believe that clergy was in either of the two priority phase one or phase two um, groups. Um, but I can look at that again and let you know. Um, if that has changed, but I did not see them in the phase one or phase two. All right. Thank you, Councilor Davila. Um, so at this time, uh, we'll move to our, our final agenda items, um, which are some reports from, from other department heads. We have about a half hour left, so we have a little bit of time for uh, the other department heads to, to brief the counselors on, on their activities right now in the COVID-19 response. As I mentioned, um, we don't anticipate that we will have all of the department heads um, necessarily on every meeting of the, the committee as a platform, but for this sort of first meeting, we just wanted to give a, people a baseline of, of where folks were at and be able to bring forward any concerns that are relevant to them. And obviously we don't have all department heads here, so um, we can certainly schedule additional department heads at future meetings. Um, but these were, were some of the department heads that I think we've been all communicating with quite a bit uh, during this. So um, We'd like to recognize now uh, Lindsay, uh, Deputy CAFO, just to give us an idea of where we're at on the financial impact and any uh, outstanding relief funds or anticipated relief funds in the near future. 
Sure. Thank you. And thank you all for calling the meeting. Um, I think it's good that we can all share this information together. Um, like Helen said, this is just a recap of the um, report that TJ gives the gives to the cabinet and the mayor on Monday. Um, so overall for FY20, the revenue impact um, to COVID on our variable revenue was about a $4.8 million loss. That was in FY20. So we're tracking the same for FY21 and the way that we're tracking it is we're comparing um, the same week, one through 52 of FY20 versus FY21. And so far FY21 tracking it that way, we're down about 2.4 million, which gives us a total kind of COVID loss that um, we're saying is about 7.3 million right now. Um, the heavy hitters for losses in revenue um, are the um, waiving of the, um, well, let me just pull it up here, I lost it. The waiving of the um, alcoholic beverage license. So we expect about 261,000 to be a loss from there. Um, we're also seeing losses for any tax lien redeemed. So um, if past due taxes are being paid off less than they have in years past, specifically in FY20 up until now. Also, we're seeing a loss on um, interest earnings and we're seeing a loss on building permits. Um, we're seeing a loss on some treasurer fees, mostly for auctions for the uh, sale and purchase of our auctioned city properties. And also another big one is um, uh, on-street parking. So parking tickets throughout the city. So those are kind of the heavy hitters where we're seeing a lot of losses. We are having some um, increases over, FY over FY20 around this time. And that is due to um, uh, increased revenue for both the golf courses, um, motor vehicle excise, um, and those are kind of where we're saving a little bit because we have additional revenue coming in on those lines. Does that answer questions about revenue? I'm good on revenue. Okay, great. So I'll move over to spending, COVID spending, and I do have Melanie Kobe. She can answer any um, more specific questions that we have, but what I'll say up until this point is um, we have many COVID specific grants and as of now, the funding, uh, I'm sorry, the spending on those is close to $20.3 million. And then we also have a deficit spending account, which we're putting charges against for now um, until we can offset them to other grant funding sources. And that's about 7.5. So all in all, our COVID spending right now is about 27.8 million. Lindsay, are there um, the CARES Act funding that was that we had to spend by the end of the year? That deadline was not extended by Congress, was it? Yes, it was until next. Oh, great. December or this December, I should say. Yes, it was. So, how much is left from the last round of CARES Act? Um, let me see, Melanie. Do you have the specifics on total spending against CARES? Yep. So, what's happening right now is that we were. Uh, reimbursed essentially the full 13 mil allocation. So we're reclassing over as the reporting periods come for CARES Act. So I can pull up now to see what the actuals are for that grant so that you can have a little bit of an understanding. So for, so again, the 13.7 million approximately is what was awarded. And as of to date, the amount that's been reclassed over onto that grant is about 5 million. So we're trying to um, hold off on reclassing or charging onto this grant until we submit the reports over to the state. Uh, so every quarter they're asking for you to essentially itemize everything to make sure that these are eligible expenses and whether or not it's CARES versus FEMA. And at that point, once those are submitted and okay to go is when we move over the funds, the expenses over onto that grant. And they, they still haven't um, passed any amendments that would classify that to be used for lost revenue, correct? Unfortunately, no, no changes with that. 
All right. Um, any questions for Lindsay or Melanie around the financial side of things? Um, folks just want to raise hands in the queue. Um, one, one thing I would just draw some attention to um, are two issues, one being uh, the housing funds that were allocated through Wayfinders. Um, I mean, I think that with the number of uh, eviction cases that we're still seeing filed um, in Springfield is really concerning to me. Um, I know that there was some issues with folks being able to get access to the state funds that were put in. It seems like they've worked through a lot of that and made it a lot more simple. But when I asked at the end of the year last year to see you know, how much of the funds that we granted to Wayfinders had actually been drawn upon, it seemed like they, it was going very well. People were accessing the funds. And so if there's a way, um, once those funds are exhausted, which I expect they probably are about to be, um, to potentially increase that allotment, I think that would be something that in the immediate term um, would have a big impact for people. So if we can look at that, I think that would be important. Um, any other questions for uh, finance? Uh, President Williams? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a, maybe a bit of a more peculiar question, but uh, we're, we're in a time where it could be, become very possible where we have a national mandate um due to kind of the transition of administration so which is do you have any information or inside maybe you've, you've dealt with this in not some other capacity where um any associated with like of course like a fine of some nature for folks not wearing masks do you do you, do you know how the city of springfield might handle something like that i don't um I obviously know that we have fines um, written up that, you know, our ordinances passed by city council. Um, I think it would probably have to start, and you guys would know this better than me, legislatively. I don't know if it would have to start with the state and allow it to be an option for cities to adopt. I don't know. Okay. Um, but um, I just don't have the answer for that. I don't know what the process right. would be for that. All right. I just, I mean, I, the only reason I mentioned is that I, that could be a, an additional uh, revenue generator down the road. And I, you know, I, I, I think that's going to be stressed, uh, certainly in Biden's administration. So I just, you know, I think that might be something to, to look out for on both sides, uh, legislatively and on your side as well. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Any other questions for finance? Uh, seeing none, uh, just the second thing I was going to mention, um, Lindsay, and I mentioned it to TJ as well, uh, is, you know, it, it, with the virtual hearings, it's become a little more expensive to publish the postings for um, folks who are appearing before the council. And so if there's a way that we might be able to offset some of that spending, um, just to at least bring the fees back to where they were, you know, businesses are having such a hard time now, I think for folks who are attempting to do business, if we could find a way to uh, bring that cost back to pre-pandemic levels. I think that would be, be key. Yeah, yeah. and TJ fun. has definitely brought that to Melanie and I as one of your concerns. Um, and I know that um, if we have any questions specifically about that, we'll reach out to you, but it's something that we are taking a look at. Okay, great. Um, so seeing uh, no further questions for finance, thank you both for, for being here. And we're doing well on time. Um, so we have two more departments with us. Um, Tim Sheehan from the uh, Department of Economic Development. Um, we'll hear uh, from Tim now about ongoing efforts to provide assistance to local businesses. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I'm going to probably confuse people a little bit because you're dealing, you're, you're talking about the CARES Act, and there's two different tranches of CARES Act funding. One that uh, Melanie was referring to is the state allocation of CARES Act back to Springfield from what the state got. The city also got direct block grant allocations from the CARES Act, and it came in two tranches um, uh, for a total uh, in terms of across the block grant allocations of roughly about $9.5 million. Um, that included both CDBG and ESG funding, which basically deals with the homelessness and the housing side of the equation um, that Jerry can reference. Um, but the, the CDBG round ultimately represented a little over $4 million of that 9.5. Um, and the ESG component represented the remaining balance. Um, we're just about, in terms of the overall allocation um, for the Black Grant uh, CARES Act funding, uh, we have either committed 
or have dispersed roughly 80% of the total allocation. Um, I think it's also important for you to know that in this last round of funding that was approved by Congress in December, there was no block grant funding uh, directly to the city coming uh, from that legislation. Um, it all is going to the state and then the state similarly as it did with this last allocation that it got from CARES will make a determination about how much money Springfield will ultimately be getting uh, in the form of that. Um, clearly we've made it known from the city side of the equation up to the congressman that uh, that uh, it, it causes all kinds of uh, procedural problems for us in terms of not being able to directly implement programming. You have to ultimately go up and get approval from the state in order to, to utilize the funding. Um, and then the, the, the state sets its own priorities around what it wants to fund. Um, so in terms of the block grant funding, uh, it's much more direct uh, uh, to the city. The city's ultimately making its own determinations uh, with how to deploy that resource without the additional level of state uh, 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 allocation uh, coming back to the city. So with that, I'll take the uh, CDBG round and then Jerry can uh, actually talk a little bit about the ESG uh, component of the block grant funding. Um, so as all of you know, uh, and this is getting back into the, the roughly $4 million that we had on the CDBG side, the vast majority of that funding uh, went for uh, direct assistance to, to businesses. Uh, we supported through grant funding at the start of this, um, hundreds of small businesses uh, with direct grants uh, just to, to try and carry them through uh, while they were either closed or you know, uh, trying to reopen in some meaningful fashion. Um, we did three rounds of business uh, uh, grant assistance. Uh, and again, there were hundreds of businesses that uh, ultimately got grants. Uh, clearly not everyone who applied got a grant. The need was just mammoth that was out there and clearly beyond the resources that we had available. Um, the vast majority of the businesses, well over 70% represented uh, minority and women owned businesses, which unfortunately have taken the brunt of the impact uh, from COVID. Uh, and uh, uh, those businesses, it, it, like so much of the impact of the virus, the, those that are in the greatest level of need ultimately have had the highest degree of impact from the virus uh, in terms of both economic and physical. Um, so that, that was uh, primarily, well, uh, where uh, the, the greatest percentage of our revenues went in terms of that direct economic development assistance. But on top of that, we also did um, uh, 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 the, um, we're, we're going into workforce development issues because now as we're realizing we're coming you know, closer to the end of this and there's so many people who have been negatively impacted from an employment standpoint. And quite frankly, you know, the uncertainty of you know, many of those jobs coming back in the near term, uh, there, there's clearly gonna be a need for uh, retraining and uh, 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 providing workforce training services. So we have a pretty good slug of, uh, uh, of resources that we're allocating in that regard. And then there's a whole uh, issue of technical assistance to the small businesses, uh, both to get them back to a point, you know, that they, they were operating pre-COVID and getting an understanding, you know, more around, okay, so they've been in business for a period in time, what 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 did their cash flow look like pre-COVID? Is there anything that we can do to to manage uh, or provide technical assistance to get them to the next level, especially with the the neighborhood businesses in those neighborhood business districts? Um, uh, those those folks are in desperate need of just having you know the one-on-one -on -one technical assistance that comes in and you know, provides an, an overview uh, as to you know, how operations can be made better, 
and more efficient, more cost effective. Um, so that's a, a pretty big component of what we're working on right now. And the other piece that we have is a uh, out of the funding, we have um, established a loan pool, but it, it's a little bit different uh, loan pool. Uh, we're, we've uh, joined forces with Common Capital um, and it, they do micro lending uh, at two small businesses um, and take a, a, a high risk position. Um, so what we, we've basically done is take the resources of common capital, combine them with our resources, and ultimately it's very, very flexible funding for small businesses that ultimately becomes tailored to that business's uh, actual needs, as opposed to having a program that's prescriptive that says, you know, th this is the maximum amount you can get, th these are the terms associated with it, this particular loan fund is really reviewing what the needs are of a particular business and tailoring the, the associated debt in a manner that responds to the needs of the business. The really flexible part about the, the, the fund is ultimately if the business ultimately is able to stay in business over a period of five years, the city's portion of that debt ultimately burns off over that five-year window. So it, it provides a, an equity position for the business going forward. Um, so those are some of the programs that we've been focused on. As I said this morning, uh, the PPP program, um, there's been some changes to that. Um, and it, actually the changes are made so that it, it's the assistance through the SBA for PPP is more directed towards the businesses that have been in directly impacted by the, the pandemic. Uh, and it's, it's tried to gear itself to be more um, uh, targeted to smaller businesses. If you're going for a second draw, you can't have more than 300 employees. Um, you, the, the loan levels are gonna be smaller as opposed to 10 million, it's gonna go down to 2 million. Um, so, uh, I think SBA has done a pretty effective job of trying to, to look at, you know, where the program probably, um, and again, it, they were responding to an immediate need, but trying to learn from, uh, uh, how they deployed resources last time and how they could do it a little more effectively to try and meet the needs of those, uh, small minority and women owned businesses. And I'll leave it at that. All right. Um, before we move on to Jerry, are there any questions for uh, Director Sheehan? Uh, Tim, my only, my only, oh, anybody? No. My uh, only question was just, um, um, is somebody saying something? Oh, no. Okay. My only question, Tim, was just, uh, do we anticipate any more, uh, any additional rounds of grant funding coming off of the last stimulus that we might be able to put into play? Well, it clearly, it, it sounds like uh, in our discussions with Congressman Neal, it sounds like uh, in the spring, there's going to be another round of funding um, coming forward in terms of relief funding, not necessarily the stimulus funding, but an additional round of relief funding. Um, you know, and it, it, as I said, we have certainly, from the city's perspective, made it clear that, you know, if oh. that funding... It, it, ultimately is realized, we, we would prefer to have it coming in terms of the, the direct block grant allocations to the city. Okay, I understand. Uh, Councilor Davila. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Tim, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just wanna make sure that I heard correctly. Um, did you say that the city has set funds aside for retraining? Workforce training, yes. Yes, and how much is in that pot right now? Uh, it, it was it, the first allocation of it was about two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, all right. Do we expect more to come? Yes, we're hopeful that there's going to be another round of relief funding, as I indicated, uh, and I it, it, we're hopeful that it's going to come via block grant. And do we have any rough idea how much a block grant might look like? Well, I, it, it depends on the size of the package that uh, the president elect is 
company is looking to put forward, but I, I would assume that we're going to be somewhere between 50 and 75% of the overall allocation that we, we had right. at the outset of this, which was roughly $4 million. Right. Now, one thing is there's jobs that definitely are not coming back, unfortunately, due to this pandemic. Um, but my question is, so what are, what are we retraining them for? Well, one of the, the one of the issues. Right, you got the words. Uh... Councilor Davila, I think we may have uh, lost you again. I, I don't know if he can hear us, but the response to that question is I, I, the successful models for workforce training, I believe actually start with the the job market and the private sector that is looking to hire people and understanding where actually those jobs are and ultimately getting engaged with an entity that's not just providing the training, but actually taking the, the prospective job applicant all the way through placement and uh, in terms of uh, monitoring uh, them uh, uh, through that first year of employment to make sure that the hurdles uh, associated with new job placement, you know, are addressed effectively. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director Sheehan. Any further questions for economic development before we move to our final agenda item, which is a report from the Director of Housing? Seeing none, Director McCafferty, thank you for making time. We saved the best for last, and we uh, look forward to hearing your brief on, I know there's been quite a bit of developments over the last year. Um, where are we right now, and how are things looking? Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to, I'm going to update on two things, actually. One is preventing displacement, eviction, and foreclosure, and the other is around homelessness. Um, so you mentioned, Councillor Letterman, uh, the money that the city put toward wayfinders for eviction prevention. Uh, the city made available $2 million. This is separate from the funds that um, uh, Tim had mentioned. Uh, these were primarily home funds. We were able to make about two, to make $2 million available uh, back in July. Uh, 1.4 million of that has been spent. I think one of the key things that happened there is we got money in early. Um, there was an eviction moratorium, eviction and foreclosure moratorium that went into mid-October. We got money in early with the hope that people would start early to try to get caught up and be caught up before the moratorium ended. And the spending went, um, the spending went, incredibly fast starting in September uh, and then in October are the, the key areas. It's actually slowed down again since, since then. Um, we do know that um, there is that is nowhere near enough money for uh, all the rent arrears in the city, but um, I do wanna make sure you know that uh, in mid-October when the moratorium was lifted the state started a program and they put $1.4 million into prevention and rapid rehousing, um, which means either you uh, pay off arrears or you're able to pay for, to move into new housing. Um, that assistance is available to households. Each household can get up to $10,000. Um, so it's pretty significant. In addition, um, and yes, in addition, the federal bill that happened at the end of December puts um, 25 billion toward rental arrears. That money, as Tim said, will come through the state, but we would expect um, both the state and the federal money to come through wayfinders. So I think that's definitely the state's model for how they wanna get that money out there. Um, it's a way to keep it flowing. Um, one of, you know, you've mentioned there were issues in the beginning with startup and long waits. Uh, Wayfinders has told me that they uh, had eight staff doing this work last year and now have 40 staff. They have considerably ramped up. There is a new initiative coming out from the state that um, is going to add some additional, well, the state did a couple of things. One was to take away some of the paperwork requirements to make it easier to process those claims faster. 
Um, and they're also adding some technology and some other support uh, to uh, the entities doing this. So they're doing you know, a number of things, hoping to speed up the, the, what's happening. Also the state law that the state, um, when the budget passed, there was also language in there that um, in housing court, if a tenant has applied for housing arrears, they're entitled to a stay of the eviction. Um, so that it can't go forward until they get an answer on, the, on the, their application. Those are the key things about housing stability. Around homelessness, um, so we went, you know, we did in the springtime, we did a model where we had um, isolation, uh, tents set up for isolation and quarantine. Um, those went away as the numbers decreased. And then we um, started to think about what a new model would be as we got an influx of federal funding and the state also got an influx of federal funding. So we've ended up doing a lot of work that has been really um, very coordinated with the state. Um, and they're now actually bringing in FEMA funds to support the same work. So the, uh, the response now has been to use hotel rooms um, as overflow. I guess a, a couple of things to note, one that the existing shelters for individuals, Friends of the Homeless and the Rescue Missions Taylor Street both had to reduce their capacity um, in order to enable social distancing. Um, Friends of the Homeless opened an auxiliary site so they actually are able to serve the same number they're usually able to serve in the winter. So they're, they're, they've stayed level, level. Uh, the, the Rescue Mission is down by maybe eight or 10 beds. So we didn't lose that much capacity, but um, you know, there's also been a recognition around the country that best practice during the pandemic is really to try to get every single person off the streets and into a place to shelter in place. So uh, using the hotel model, we have gotten a lot of people off the streets and that has included people who will not go into shelter, either you know, into congregate shelter, often because of, you know, either worries about COVID, worries about theft, uh, paranoia about being around those number of people. We've gotten quite a few into hotels. And what we and the state have together funded is a model that includes street outreach that works toward putting people in motel rooms where they have intensive case management and actually uh, nursing care, nursing and community health worker care attached to them also. Uh, which is, and then a case management that does housing search and we have funds for housing placement. So there's sort of a uh, um, continuum of services that are being funded again through the feds, the state and FEMA that are going from the street into housing. Um, the primary provider um, is Catholic Charities, although they're very closely working with Friends of the Homeless also on that. Um, initiative. And, you know, at some point back in early fall, they had something like 150 people in hotels. They're down to about 120, um, which has also included some new people coming in. So they've probably housed 30 or 40 people um, coming out of, you know, into either permanent supportive housing or apartments they can afford um, once a subsidy goes away. Um, so those, we've actually been able to also um, give some funding to the YWCA to sort of replicate that model for people experiencing domestic violence. They have funds for um, outreach, hotel rooms and uh, housing assistance. And then we've given some funds to New North Citizens Council, which is working specifically with people who are released from jail to uh, be able to give them housing assistance to get settled so that they don't have to go into the shelter system because they're able to access those funds right away. Um, I think a couple other things to, to just note, um, the state has made vaccinations available to shelter staff um, and that process went forward, I believe this past week. And the state has an initiative specifically around vaccinating people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and they're working direct, I, under, 
I think I understand <laughs> more just from being in meetings, but they're working directly with the shelters to make that happen. Um, and, you know, they see the homeless population as the high priority population. So we're expecting that probably within the next two weeks. Thank you, Director McEverty. Yeah, that was going to be my question was I had seen a report that, um, you know, we had the state at least had reached the congregate living setting of the phase one. So I wanted to know where Friends of the Homeless and Taylor Street uh, and the rescue mission were with that. Um, so will you be able to uh, get that information just to see uh, if they have already the, done it? So the state is in the process of talking directly to them. I don't think they've given them a date yet, but um, I can follow up and see what else. But it seems do. like the state will set up the administration so I know there was some, they, I know that they talked to Friends of the Homeless about Friends of the Homeless being able to do it on site, um, that they're, that large facilities may be able to self-manage it. But then I know Catholic Charities with their hotel population counts as a shelter and Catholic Charities said, We're, we can't do that. So um, they told me that they reached out to the state to say, help us and the state is making some arrangement with someone else to do those vaccinations that will happen on site at the hotel rooms. Okay, I think it's. A, I think that's also a conversation. Maybe when we schedule our next uh, meeting, specifically on on vaccine distribution. You know, I think I wonder if there's not a way that um, we can't reach out to, you know, some other partners in the community around trying to assist those types of facilities, and also in the future for our our own general population, whether that's medical schools, nursing schools. I mean, uh, you know, I think there's, there's, we could get some, some assistance from trained medical professionals um, to provide that. So, so we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Um, are there any uh, further questions for the director, President Williams? Mr. Chair, I'll be, I'll be brief. Hi, Jerry, it's good to see you again. Um, I, I was just wondering in regards to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I know some of the funds that, you know, um, have been, of course, uh, distributed to wayfinders and maybe a few other places might allow for some utility assistance as well. Um, and I, I was I was just wondering, is there any coordination happening with, you know, of course, things related to gas and electric specifically? Um, or is there anything in place I should would uh, disallow them to shut utilities off um, for any period of time as, as folks are going through the pandemic? Um, so first, the first part of that was funds for utilities. So our funds can be used for utilities. Uh, so can all of those state and federal funds. So all of those programs, I mentioned rent and mortgage, but they also cover utilities. Um, and I know we have been paying out, you know, I've been watching what the claims are for. We have paid out a lot of money in utilities. Um, I, I don't know of any pandemic related interference with shutoffs um there there is director there, the utility the utilities are still under order to uh cease shutoffs oh terrific great that's good it's good to know thank you Councilor davila uh thank you mr chair uh at least my hope that i uh i have a better connection now um i have a question regarding the the actual housing situation in springfield um, do either, uh, this question is for the, um, uh, for the, uh, for the, um, uh, Ms. McCaffrey, uh, or anybody from the city, do we have an accurate picture of what the actual housing situations in Springfield as it relates to COVID-19, either to Jerry, how many people do we have in eviction? Uh, did eviction numbers go up? Um, the requests for evictions have gone up or? Because do we have an accurate picture of what's happening? I actually, so the, the, what I know about evictions, um, so as I mentioned earlier, there was a state moratorium until mid-October. Um, the last numbers I heard, um, and I wasn't able to research this um, for tonight to find out current, but through mid-December, in Springfield, there have been 237 uh, cases filed for non-payment or they were no-fault evictions with a non-payment claim. Um, 
So that would have been, you know, I guess that would have been how many were active in mid-December. Um, I, it is, I don't know. So then there is this other moratorium in effect um, by the feds and we expect it to be, um, it, it, the, the moratorium, the federal moratorium, it was an order by the CDC um, and it was complicated and harder for tenants to use. My understanding is that uh, everyone believes that President Biden, it's lovely to say that, <laughs> President Biden will be um, uh, issuing an expanded and simplified uh, moratorium that is nationwide. Um, so I don't fully have the answer to your question around how many people are, um, are facing eviction right now. Uh, a month ago, it was 237. I think that um, we're, uh, there are many, many efforts to make sure that people know, including in the housing court, that they can get assistance and stop their case. I don't know how many are actually how many executions are actually happening. Right. Uh, I'm not hearing of them, the executions happening. I have hearing of some that were outstanding, but not that they're happening yet. Right, right. Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry, for, for that. Uh, Mr. President, if I, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair, if I may suggest, um, I realize that this is a moving target to a degree. Uh, I know we are waiting to see what happens with the incoming president as to what kind of policy is gonna develop. Uh, but I do think that perhaps maybe down the road we can uh, have a meeting specifically on uh, the eviction and the follow up with it. So we end up being a penny wise and pound foolish. Um, 237 people uh, or evictions translates probably to maybe 600, 700 people at risk in my mind. Um, and it's something that I, I, I will suggest that we keep a close attention to as we progress on this got off a pandemic. I, I, I certainly agree, Councilor Davila, and I, you know, I think the director's numbers are, are uh, as of December, I've heard, you know, there's some significantly more now that have also been filed. And I think what, what we have seen is there's been some, some laws that got passed at the end of the year that the budget or that the, the governor did sign, um, which have brought some really strong requirements in. Uh, for example, now, if you have a pending um, application, for rental assistance, it's an automatic extension by the housing court. The housing court will automatically continue right. your case until that decision is made. Um, they're also requiring uh, certain information to accompany event eviction notices um, that can lead right. people towards that. Um, so I think we certainly can put it on as a, a broader discussion um, to get more of that information out. And uh, there's, a, I mean, I know the you know, our department is doing great work. There's also a lot of organizations um, that are out there that are following up. So um, I agree, it's a, a one of the most pressing issues. So we definitely will will schedule that for a future meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Jerry. So seeing uh, no further questions, thank you so much, uh, Director. I think just just one thing that I would uh, pose, and I know um, I think Mel, uh, uh, Ms. Kobe and uh, Ms. Hackett are still here as well. Um, there's one category uh, of constituent that I've heard from who, uh, you know, we may not, and I think this was actually brought up when we set the tax rate, there's sort of a small, there's a group of people who may have, who own their homes, but may have been financially impacted. And so now are facing their, their tax bills. And I don't think there's really any funding in place that speaks to that. If you have a mortgage and you escrow your taxes, you can get mortgage assistance. But so far, it seems like, um, I, I haven't been able to find a, a necessarily a place to refer them. I, the ones that happened to have reached out to me did qualify for some of the abatements. So we were able to connect them with that resource. Um, but just in terms of assistance in that regard, um, we may need to look into that, into that a little bit. Uh, so seeing no further questions, um, our next meeting will be uh, next Tuesday at 4.30. Um, we will be joined by the commissioner at that time. The president and I have discussed uh, the possibility of inviting um, some individuals to come talk about uh, food security access. Uh, during the pandemic and the resources that are available in that. Um, as we'll continue to schedule meetings, just counselors, if you want anything on the agenda, just let us know. And we'll certainly put that on, on the weekly agenda, any particular individuals or groups you'd like us to uh, bring before uh, the committee, or if you just have a topic that you would like to discuss, uh, something you've been working on that you'd like to collaborate with 
any department head or counselor on. Um, that is the, the goal of the committee. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we did pretty well on time. And uh, at this time, we'll adjourn the meeting.